the courage to go the extra step. Yeah. And it often takes, you know, the more darker areas we go to, the more disturbed clients, the more trauma that we have to visit can often take quite a lot of courage for the therapist. Yeah. But the, then the client feels really met. Yeah. They feel somebody's there. They feel somebody is providing protection. And um, it does take courage from the therapist because, you know, often over my career, I've said to myself, do I really want to go there? You know, do I, do I need to go to these darker places or have I phrased in my head? And thank God I you say yes, because they need to have a therapist, I believe, that will accompany them to the darkest places. Oh. That takes courage. <laughs> We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode number 56 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with myself, Jackie Jones. And as always, I need to come up with a different word other than wonderful, Bob. Say fabulous. The fabulous Bob <laughs> Cook. <laughs> quite so like that. this episode, we're going to be looking at the five most important qualities a therapist needs to cultivate for effective therapy. That's a wonderful title. I think it's about 15 years ago when I was in maybe even longer, I was sitting in the Institute and I don't know what I was doing particularly. I think I was eating my lunch or something. And there was a doc, it was before the buzzer system. So it must be 20 years ago. Um, anyway, there's a knock on the door and I answered it. So it must be a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, you don't answer the door anymore. <laughs> no, 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 that's true. And uh, there was this, I don't know how old he was, mid twenties person, he said, he said, could I, could I have a word with you? I said, why is that? He says, I'm doing my PhD or, or something of that significance. Um, he said, uh, 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 and uh, I wanted to talk to the, I don't think he said great psychotherapist, but he said well-known therapist about, um, you know, the qualities a psychotherapist needs to have um, to be an effective uh, psychotherapist. And uh, your name was passed on to me. Would you like that? So I thought about that and I said, how long will it take to talk about the subject? He said about half an hour. So I said, fine, come in. I think I must have around my lunch, so he came in. I think I was there the next two hours, by the way. But <laughs> um, <clears throat> I remember talking about this. So I think it's a great podcast and I'm not sure, um, a lot. I tell you what, I watch a lot of reality television programs and they often say, uh, not in any linear order. So even though I know what we're talking about uh but then it's not really a top order here but i have got one we can start off with go on then curiosity yes i think i really think and it's a be up near number one that uh the more curious i mean you might call this no noise you know nosy but i'm going to say curious the more curious a therapist is the better with yes. their client i'm talking about do you what do you think Hundred percent. I love that. I'm always telling my clients to be curious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it comes along with awareness and self awareness. We need to be curious about our response and reactions to things. I think. Yeah, I, I, I think that most clients will come, and they've had a history of people who haven't accounted for them, may maybe not in, have been interested in them, and have got what we call in the TA world, don't be important injunctions. Yeah. And the more curious you are of how the past affects the present, the more you will meet your client. And yeah. actually, the more they will feel met. Yeah, I love curiosity. Whether it borders on nosiness or not, I think yeah. curiosity is curiosity. brilliant. Um, and we are, as therapists, we have to get to know how the, the past affects the present, their past affect the present, and help them understand themselves. Now, we can't do that unless we're curious. So yeah. it's a possibility. 
yeah i don't mean interrogation i mean curiosity and uh, what i mean by that is asking open questions to tell me a little bit more about that oh that's interesting you know those sort of adjoining questions not the closed questions just demand a yes and no answer yeah yeah and we do that through inquiry it's it, you know yeah. it is yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. It's in our world phenomenological inquiry or inquiry but you see inquiry you know it, in a certain way it hasn't got to be perceived as interrogation it needs to be much more a series of open transactions yeah tell me more about that oh wow that sounds really difficult for you was it yeah and it's done from the nurturing channel and often you might lower your voice in the inquiry but it's all in the service of the client yeah. now it helps that i'm a curious person anyway by the way me too. i mean i were <laughs> I, before i came to the profession you know i've been known as somebody who who would actually just enjoy um people watching yeah uh, and enjoy i was known as somebody who who was asked uh, lot of curiosity questions anyway but certainly clinically it's really important yeah and not to give that up even if you're with a person seven or eight years and think when you were saying that i was thinking about it and when you go out to a party or you meet somebody or or whatever it is usually the other person is talking about themselves all the time and they don't ask us yeah, questions I <laughs> completely so it's nice to be, you know, curious and inquire about the other person. I think, it, I don't know if it's top on the list, but it's really high. And yeah. another one which is very high as well is humour. Yeah. The quality for a therapist to have a high sense of humour. Now, I mean humour with the client. I don't mean humour at the client. I mean humour as a, as a way of not only meeting the client but also lightening the process because often a lot of uh therapy can be you know perceived as quite uh going to the dark places which may well be but also we need to visit the light places so there's some 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 sort of um lightness is in this process because it often can be very heavy and so the the, the humor has to be um how can i explain this has to be used clinically uh but it is a marvelous quality for a therapist to have yeah i believe yeah but some clients you would use humor much more than others by the way so people who are often antisocial passive aggressive you would actually use humor much more than you would perhaps produce hysteronic or or, or other adaptations but on a general level you know uh I think the quality of humour and how you use it in the service of the clinical world and the client is an important quality to have. Yeah. What do you think? Do you, yeah. do you agree with me on that? Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I, I think you need to be very careful on how you use yeah, it just in, in the therapy room. Yeah. But yeah, whether it's being liked hearted or you know, I think part of my personality is I don't tend to take life too seriously. So it's just knowing that, like you say, there is an opposite to the dark side that we can use within the therapy. And I think that's overlooked sometimes. No, so you're, you're right. I, 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 I completely agree with you about um, it can be, uh, I won't say misused, but perceived in a different way. But I'm talking about the opposite to the dark places yeah. where we can sort of have a bit of lightness in the process yeah and it, celebrate your wins in the therapy room do you know what i mean sometimes i say to clients you can come here and talk about positive things as well as you know the not so positive things it doesn't always need to be doom and gloom you can let me know the good stuff that's going on in your life too i think that's why i like a check-in at the beginning mm -hmm. rather than going straight into the hard stuff it's okay for to let me know what's gone well this week no, I couldn't agree with you more. So we've got, uh, you know, humour, curiosity. How about you having a quality? Otherwise, I'll just go through five of them. 
I'm not, I, I don't know where you'll take this. For me, it's about taking risks in the therapy room as well. Courage. Or, How about courage? Courage, yeah. Maybe taking risks isn't the right way of doing it, but yeah, courage. courage. I think vitally, vitally important. You, you know, um, if the, the therapist needs to be courageous. Now, what I mean by that is courageous for the client as well, in the service of the client. So, so uh, the, I'll tell you a good example of this. I worked with somebody for about 11 or 12 years and she was working through quite, well, a lot of challenges. And we did a really good job and, you know, I felt professional satisfied. Well, anyway, about four years ago, she appeared on my doorstep again. And she said, uh, besides other things, she wanted to thank me for going the extra mile. Uh, yeah. So in the concept what we're talking about, that's what I mean. The courage to go the extra step. Yeah. And it often takes, you know, the more darker areas we go to the more disturbed clients the more trauma that we have to visit can often take quite a lot of courage for the therapist yeah but the, then the client feels really met yeah they feel somebody's there they feel somebody's providing protection and um it does take courage from the therapist because you know Often over my career, I've said to myself, do I really want to go there? You know, do I, do I need to go to these darker places or have I phrased in my head? And thank God I you say yes, because they need to have a therapist, I believe, that will accompany them to the darkest places. Oh. That takes courage. Yeah. It does. And I would imagine there's a lot of, you know, therapists out there that that wouldn't be comfortable going to those dark places. Yeah, yeah. So again, it's therapy, I get I know all that. And yeah. Um because sometimes they come up in the most unlikely places. Oh. You know, it's kind of like I, I'm really conscious of my I don't want to say specialism, but if I'm not I don't feel qualified in a particular area, whether that's, you know, anorexia or a particular type. But these things can come up during any session. Mm. And it, it's about how you how you deal with that. And, you know, not only having the courage and the confidence, but. Yeah, not leaving your client hanging to a certain extent. Yes, uh, and and they may not have had anyone yeah accompany them and feel protected by to put themselves together again yeah so courage is a very important quality and the yeah well let's just say that in fact for effective results it's really important yeah Listening skills, them are important. Yeah, the quality to account for the other, to really listen to the, the other person is very important. And listening, you know, is a really interesting quality because it isn't just listening to the verbal transactions. No. It's listening to the non-verbal transactions. Yeah. It isn't just listening to people, what people are doing, it's listening Let's put another phrase. It's listening therapeutically. Yes. And when we talk about listening therapeutically, we mean listening to the whole of them. Yeah. Yeah, totally. The words that they're saying, what they're not saying, the body language shifting in their seat, the, all sorts of things. Yeah. Where they choose to sit in the room can say everything about everything. how they're feeling. Yeah, so listening is a very important quality. And I always think it's giving the client the opportunity to get to their own truth. Yeah. Now, you have to really listen and give the space 
for uh, that process to happen. But you're so you're right. It's listening at all levels, spiritually, physically, yeah. uh, emotionally, cognitively, uh, non-verbally. And often to maybe say something like, you know, what is it you want to tell me that you haven't told me? How's that for a transaction? Yeah. In the world of listening. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think listening is really important. I've got a question. So that's maybe the fourth, but let's, I'll give you another one I really like. Kindness. Yeah. I, I think the quality of an open heart of the therapist. Um, and kindness is such a wonderful attribute to have. Now, I know it comes a lot from being kind to yourself. So if you're not kind to yourself, it's much harder to model. I mean, another podcast we've talked about compassion and love. So it's in the same ballpark. Yes. Yeah. It's in the same ballpark, kindness. But most of the clients, oh, I don't know if this is a fair summary, but I'm going to say it. Most of the clients I've seen over my clinical world of 38 years, um, kindness has been so important to them because they've had a world of unkindness. Yeah. And sometimes it's too overwhelming for them, like I've said in another podcast. But, you know, I think that, oh, the next quality I, I'm going to, the timing of how you uh, perhaps give the kindness transaction, if you want to put it that way. Uh, it, it is important but kindness is a quality you know if, if you said to me I think the top thing I would want for any therapist at all for me uh, if I if I was to do therapy it would be that they um, have a high quality of kindness and an open heart yeah I don't want an unkind therapist no definitely not that's that's the last thing I know. I've had a history of that in no. my history. Yeah. Trauma is built and trauma is built on unkindness. And we need an antidote to trauma. Yeah. So I want a therapist that is, has the high quality of kindness. Now, it doesn't have to be necessarily through verbal transactions, but in fact, a lot of kind actions are non-verbal. Yeah, again, it's the intent, isn't it, behind the questioning or whatever it is that's going on. It's the intent behind it. And that's, you You can't even describe that, but you know when it's there. <laughs> you know when it, there's a good face. You know because you feel it. Yeah, yeah. You feel that action. Yeah, even when there's no words, you, you, you can, you know that, it's there, the positive intent is there, yeah. Oh. So that, that's quite, and, uh, another quality I said, I want to not forget, is the quality, and you, I know you learn this in the, therapy, in the therapy training, so I'm not sure if it's quality, but it's a sense of timing mm. by the therapist. The therapy has a, a therapist has a real quality or qualitative process. And they think about when they're going to say things, when they're going to time their transactions. Uh, I think it's a really important quality. Yeah. Because the therapists that rush in or the therapists that don't think about pacing, timing, attunement, when to actually deliver a transaction, it makes for a less effective psychotherapy in my book. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's often a taught process or experience, but also I think I think the client has the quality of listening out to the rhythmic attunement between the two people, therapist and client. It's a pretty special quality to have. Mm. I think I could I can distinctly remember the first time where I experienced piercing. And it, it wasn't probably the way it should be, but it was a really anxious client who was, was rushing. And I found myself feeling anxious and rushing along with them. And it was a conscious effort for me to take a breath 
and just slow everything in the room down. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the first time I'd actually been aware of that in the room. Yeah, so it's a very important quality. Yeah. Have you got another one? I know you have courage. Have you got, I, I seem to have gone. I like before. creativity. Yes. In the therapy yeah. room. Yeah, that's a wonderful quality, isn't it? It's, I mean, instead of doing the same thing over and over and over, oh. think outside the box. If it's not working, be creative. I, I think that is what a wonderful quality that is to have. I would always want one of my therapists to have a sense of creativity to be able to use different dimensions of their psyche to allow them. I don't want the therapist to think in your language, think outside the box. Um, that's a, that's a marvelous quality to have for a therapist. And usually with it comes um, a very positive, a very positive energy stream. Yeah. So the, the energies, um, uh, on a different dimension to the cognitive transactions. Yeah. So I, I very much like creativity. Sometimes, you know, even being creative in the way that we deliver therapy, you know, you do, with some clients sitting on a chair, just talking is quite difficult for them in some sessions. You know, to get up and to move around or to, I don't know, open, I, before now I've opened my corridor and clients have lobbed cushions up the corridor and yeah, yeah, shouted or whatever. It's, it's just well, it moves it up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it, it moves away from cognitive exchange. Yeah. And that models also um, permissions for the clients to go to different dimensions as well. Yeah. So... I couldn't agree with you more. I have one I really want to mention before you, the podcast ends, um, and that's ethical. That, that, mm. a, that, that I want a therapist that is ethical, and I'll tell you what I mean by that, the quality of you know, being ethical, an ethical process. Um, because what I mean by that is a therapist that treats the client with respect. Yeah genuineness transparency and sincerity yeah i would want a therapist like that i i would feel safer my younger self would feel safer my confidentiality would be respected yeah my whole sense of being would be respected i'd feel the person was on my side so i would want an ethical practitioner yeah not somebody who perhaps would break brand boundaries or come from an unethical place or uh, isn't transparent with me. Um, I want to. I want a client that is ethical in the in the ways that I've just talked about. Eth yeah. Ethicality. Yeah. And again, with with most of these qualities, I suppose we need to prove it. Oh, yeah. we can't just say it we need yeah. to be doing yeah. it and we need to prove yeah. it it's not going to happen in the first session no that's a very that's a very good uh what you said and so i'm not really don't want to disagree especially about ethicality but and some of those qualities you talked about you know within 10 minutes yes so kindness yes love yeah. Oh, kindness you know you just know that yeah um if you really listen to your intuition but i agree with you in the terms of earning it yeah um i don't um, think we should expect our clients to trust us and believe us from the moment they walk in through the door it's, it's like you say it's a process not an event and oh. it's been consistent oh that's right so I'm, I'm sure there's many, many more where there are I could go on, but we're coming to the end. But I, I wanted to sort of end on that one almost because, yeah, you know, respect, sincerity, genuineness, transparency, being accounted for in a real genuine way is are such important, you know, ethical processes. Yeah. 
And unfortunately, there are people out there that aren't ethical. No, that's why I wanted to. That's absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. And I would say to any of the listeners, you know, uh, first of all, being ethical means that you're going to be effective. And for those people going to therapy themselves, if you haven't got an ethical therapist, or all the things I'm just talking about, then leave. Mm. But certainly for the therapist to be, or, or therapists who are listening to this, um, yeah, by being sincere, by being transparent, by being genuine, by be, having that sort of, you know, qualities, therapy will be much, much more effective because the, th the client will feel safe, contained, and the younger part of the self uh, will be able to talk more easily and go to the places they need to go to with you. Yeah. Um, so the qualities we talked about may not all be there in one person, but yeah. I think I do think they are important qualities to to you know as a prerequisite for effective therapy, uh, effective therapy. And I think it's important to talk about actually. And the more I talking like we're talking now about this on the podcast, I think it's really important to talk about and i'll tell you what i, I know this people have come in and have said you know i have had the courage to come back to therapy when i've had a bad experience they know the difference yes a therapist who be not had those qualities we're talking about and yeah. a therapist that do yeah definitely yeah yeah. And it's it's one of those, you know, again, we we don't really hear from our clients, you know, that you've done a good job a lot of the time. No, you are right, yeah. You yeah. know, so it, when they do come back, and I, exactly the same, you know, they've gone for two years, sometimes three years, and then suddenly they, they come back again because a life event has happened. And then that's when they'll usually say, you helped me so much, you know, with what I was going through last time. And that speaks volumes, as well as word of mouth stuff. Well, we, this we can't teach this, can we, Bob? Can we? Can we? we? Teach, no, no, you're right. You are right. I think you can teach timing to a certain extent. I think you teach ethicality to a certain extent. But some other things like kindness, courage, humour, I think it's important to talk about them. But um, for many therapists, uh, they either have, have that naturally or I think they can give, oh, I t I th yeah, they can be given permissions by their own therapist to actually be that way. Yeah. So, so let me give an example. Um, you know, how can I explain this? If you have a trauma-based history, you will close your heart. Yeah, understandably, yeah. Yeah. So as you work with the trauma and the toxic history, you'll open your, you'll open your heart. Yeah. And an open heart is going to make for the most effective therapist. Mm. So it's, it's often when you say that, yes, you're right at a level, but you know, the more, the more trauma you've had, the more closed off, off you are, the more disconnected you are from yourself. You don't allow yourself to be humorous. You don't allow yourself that lightness. You don't allow yourself the open heart. You don't allow yourself to be creative because you've closed all those things down. Yeah. So really, I'm going back to what I say on many podcasts. The more therapy do you do yourself, the more likely you are able to nurture these qualities we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Which again, you know, taking my cap off to you and the assessment process that, you know, I can remember going through before I signed up for the four years training at the Manchester Institute of Psychotherapy. Yeah. Mm. I suppose you've got to, weed out certain people you know who can yeah. you see i mean i've been doing this training for a long time 
And if I go back before, um, I don't know, before we were training a credit organisation, the UK, say, UKCP, or even before regulating bodies, um, perhaps I would have allowed people into the training. Uh, for, for example, the uh, prerequisites, because we're a training credit organisation of the UK, so people have to have, 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 a, have a degree, for example. They've had to have this, this and the other. Yeah. So by definition, if people haven't had a degree, and certainly some uh, degree in the caring professions, or they are been in the caring professions, then, you know, we, we ask them to go on counselling courses or whatever it is to get some sort of sense of academic capacity because we have essays to write and these things and et cetera, et cetera. But I know that the most effective therapists aren't the therapists that particularly can write, you know, being, having a degree, having academic capacity in my book doesn't always mean that they're going to be effective therapists. But that's good because I didn't have any of them, yeah, Bob. <laughs> that's because you before we were part of the UKCP and those were prerequisites and demands they have in 2022. Yeah. But if you go back the psychotherapies in the evolution and its genesis and its earlier days, there wasn't that there weren't the demands there are now. And some yes. of the demands that come now, by the way, I don't I understand them because we are where we are. And I know that you can, you know, a trainee therapist can know all the theories in the world, but if they, if they can't open their heart out yeah. up, and they can't do all the things we're talking about or as difficult as challenges there, then they are gonna have a harder road to be an effective psychotherapist. Yeah. I agree. Um, you can't think your way through therapy. It, it doesn't. It doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. You can't think your way through. That's a very good phrase. Um, so, it's a different sort of training nowadays. But what I will say anyway, I really like that last phrase of yours, uh, because your own therapy is going to be the precursor to this. Yeah. That if you do your own therapy you're far more likely to be able to open up and be the therapist with these qualities that we've talked about. Yeah. What a wonderful place to finish, Bob, as always. Um, I don't, we haven't got a title for the next episode. I don't know what we're doing, so it'll be a You've surprise. got your huge list, but you haven't got your huge list next year. I haven't, no. So I'll it, just... It, it could be. I know it won't be, by the way. <laughs> it might I... be. Because I haven't put this list, I haven't put this title on this list, but one of them we, I would like to have sometime or other, whenever this may be, is how the therapist deals with the unexpected processes that occur in therapy. Um, right. And uh, that's another, another podcast. So let's leave what's next in the world of uh, unexpectancy or surprise, if you like. We will do, but I've written that one down because I think that's a good title. Yeah, because often the most unexpected things can occur. Oh, I can guarantee in every session something unexpected happens. <laughs> yeah, Whatever all, that is. I was taught a long time ago, but it takes a lot of experience to get to the position, that everything actually that happens is all grist to the mill. If the therapist can creatively use the unexpected occurrence in the you know in the service of the client yeah now that's yeah. that's the bit and maybe that's when you've got to think outside the box sometimes <laughs> the creativity you talk about that'd exactly. be a great podcast wouldn't it right well i've written it down we'll do that one next time yeah and whatever's on this list so oh, i look forward to that yes thank you so much bob and you're I welcome you lots of love to you thank you and you speak to you soon take care Bye. Bye, bye, bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.